uh, this month in our native gardens. It is now April. I uh, hope everyone survived April Fools. Um, we're all the fool because we thought it was spring and now it's winter again, right? <laughs> so, so this event is, uh, this Zooming is hosted by Wild Ones St. Louis and um, you can go to the Wild Ones YouTube page and see the recordings of this. And, um, and also like, so if you are watching this as a recording, if you want to sign up to see it live, uh, you can go to um, the Wild Ones website to sign up and see this on the first Wednesday of the month, usually, unless there's weather. And so um, in this presentation, I kind of loosely go over the Wildflower Garden Planner for the month. So if you have a planner, you can go to April and follow along and take notes in your book. And uh, so April, I, I was thinking earlier, I think that March, like the official color of March is white for white flowers. And I think the official color of April is yellow. So um, especially like celandine poppies and the browns will blooming. Um, Golden Alexanders, like there's a lot of yellow going on in April. Um, I don't know, maybe I should give each month an official color. I don't know. Think about that. So this here is Celandine Poppy in the foreground and in the background. Back here, this looks like groundsel to me, probably. The golden groundsel. So this month we're going to be going over um, garden cleanup and whether it's time to do it yet or not, um, growing bees. And that's why I have my, uh, my bee block here in the house. Hopefully nobody hatches today. Um, we're going to talk about how woodlands are a good inspiration this time of year. Um, plant ponds. Um, so ways that, like in spring, we get a lot of rain, ways to save it with rain barrels and such. Why you should kill your Bradford pear. I imagine you all know that, but we'll go over that again. Uh, I have a picture of salad I ate today, uh, made out of weeds out of my yard. Uh, plant seedlings, ecotype, and we have Shannon uh, visiting today, and she's going to help us understand ecotype. She has cool maps to show us. Uh, we will anticipate hummingbirds showing up, talk about seeds that explode. So, got some stuff going on this month. So, let's get started. So, these are some photos from well, a drawing and two photos from this time of last year. We found these luna moths out. Has anybody seen a luna moth in their yard already? I've seen a couple of posts about that on Facebook with people saying they saw them. They're big, big moths. It's really cool to see them. And the only way you're going to see a luna moth in your yard is if you leave the leaves. So you, you have to leave your leaves. They're in the leaf litter. If you bag up all your leaves and ship them away, you're throwing out all your luna moth chrysalises. So don't do that. And um, down here, there's a picture of a chrysalis. So they're, they're actually fairly big, but when they're wrapped up in leaves, it's really hard to see them. They're the same color. So April is an exciting month. It is National Native Plant Month, which I don't know when they designated that, but that's kind of cool that native plants have their own month. And then we have two Arbor Days this month. April 2nd is Missouri Arbor Day. April 30th is National Arbor Day. You should plant a tree on both those days. Um, and then April 22nd is Earth Day, which is another day to plant a tree. I plant a tree on all three days. And um, and then we have plant sales season is starting soon. So April 28th is the Partners for Native Landscaping Native Plant Fair at um, Beyond at Beyond Housing. Is that what it is? Yeah, Beyond yeah. Housing in um, Pine Lawn. That's where it was last year too. Yep. And so that's a really great place to get native plants. And if you missed that one, then May 3rd and 4th, the Shaw Nature Reserve Spring Wildflower made a plant sale this time. So 
May is a good time for planting things because there's still, this is probably not going to freeze anymore and there's still enough rain to water everything in so you're not lugging hoses all day long. And so registration started this morning, I think, for the native plant garden tour. So you go to the Audubon website and we have Shannon here. She can, did you want to say just a little bit about this, Shannon? Yeah. So um, just a quick note that the picture on the screen is actually last year's. Um, this, up, this year is Saturday, uh, May 18th. And it's in the Lindenwood Park, Southwest City area. Um, actually, my house is on the tour, so you can come see my house. I don't know why I committed to doing that, but I'm excited. Um, Mine's on there, too. Yeah, awesome. It's going to be a great time. Our rest stop this year is the excuse me, Schlafly Bottle Works location um, in Maplewood. So you can garden hop, grab lunch, grab a beer. It should be a good time. Again, that's May 18th. Yeah. So Shannon, you might want to, I just quick Google search Native mm -hmm. Wild Ones Native Plant Tour, and this was my first hit. Yeah, that's good. Out, so you might want to edit that. Yeah. And, and I did not check the date because I was like, oh, there it is. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <for sure. laughs> it's, I know it's on like Facebook. We put it all out on there. I will have to check the website though. Yeah, that's I did cool. see it on Facebook too. Mm -hmm. But not everyone has Facebook. Okay, so everybody's question right now is when can I cut down all the plants? Because I left them up all winter for those bugs. When can I cut them down? And the answer I got from Nina was never, never cut them down. <laughs> but mid-April, like it probably is like the happy medium between a garden that looks good and saving as many bugs as possible. So if you can just wait till mid-April, I know that the last several warm days, everybody had garden fever and wanted to get out there and, you know, clear the land so that you can see all those little cute spring things coming up. But you have to wait for the cute little bees too. They are still in there. And so and I wanted to show you my bee block here. This is a, a chunk. This is my deck, part of my deck right here. And the bees live in here. And so each little compartment is filled with a different type of leaf from the leaf minor bees. And they're filled like from here all the way back to bee eggs in all of these little holes here. And it's really fun to watch them fill this up because they'll just be, you know, back and forth, back and forth with leaves. And I can just sit there in a chair and watch them fill it. They have no interest in me whatsoever. They're just very busy making a home. And um, so one thing I was discussing with Laura, though, before well, we started today was, um, like, so I've heard that houses that are not, that are only this deep, like this is not too deep. I don't know. I don't have a measuring. It's like four inches, maybe. And when bees lay their eggs, like so, they're going in through the side. And this back part here, this is where the females are, and the front part is the males. And if you don't make your house deep enough, you only have males. There's no room for females in this area. So you got to make really deep ones, which maybe this is not deep enough. I don't know. Laura, do you have anything to add to that? I, th I think I remember from the lecture with Wild Ones last year that they said it needs to be at least three inches. That if you have more than three inches, then the females will be in, in the back of that. Yeah. And, and the diameter of the hole to vary it. They said that you want them to be um, of fun. various sizes for the different species. I have two inches of girls here, then I guess. How how big was yours? Five inches. Okay. I'm curious. Do you mind if I ask a quick question about that? Yeah, go ahead. So, do you know? Is it like you need four inches, and then the back two inches somehow is what causes females to develop? Like a lot of reptiles 
the soil temperature is what determines the gender of the, the sex of the eggs that are laid. So I'm curious, is that what's going on? Or is it just that the females seek out different depths or what's going on? Um, the, from what I remember is the, the female laying the eggs determined where to lay what sex. I, I'm pretty sure I'm not hundred percent sure on that, but yeah. that was the, um, the, just that I came away with that yeah. depending on the length, she was determining where to lay what sex. That's so yeah. interesting. The, the boys have to come out first because they disperse to go find other females and then they want the females to come out later so that they aren't interbreeding with their brothers and so some men from a different hole can come in yeah huh that makes sense thank you uh and then so if if there is anybody else on this call that knows about bees another question i always get is when is the best time to clean these out like obviously this one is loaded with bees right now and I don't want to clean it but you do want to clean your blocks each year so that you don't have those little bee mites building up in here but just like bird nests they get those little mites in there and bees have their own sets of mites but I don't know what time is the best time to clean this in between bee hatches so if anyone has that answer let me know So also, like, you don't have to cut chunks out of your deck for your bees. You can, like, just have some dead wood in your yard mm -hmm. or uh, bumblebees. They like just bare ground and they build little burrows in there. So it's nice to always have some patches of bare ground for the bumblebees to nest. So that's so my... Uh, when, my, when my ground cover doesn't fill out, I say it, those bare patches are for the bumblebees. Yeah. I, one time I had some extra um, sand and I put it down in one area for the bees and I did have some bees nest in that sand area because yes, they, they, like, they like the sand. But uh, I think it's cool when, like, I know there's this place at uh, Johnson Shedden's that I go in the picnic area and there's just so many bees nesting in that area and you can sit at a bench and just watch bees coming at, in and out of the ground. And, and it's not um, yellow jackets, like, you know, <laughs> you don't want to see the yellow jackets coming out of the ground usually, but these are just harmless bees that are in individual burrows and not out to sting you. All right. Um, are there any other questions about cleanup for bees? All right, uh, so another thing is uh, in April, everybody decides that their beauty berry is dead. And this is what my beauty berry looks like. And this is probably what it's going to look like for the next month. Because beauty berries, they take forever to leaf out. Like everything else leafs out before beauty berries. And a lot of times, like my beauty berry does die back. So this section might really be dead. But at the base, I'll see some leaves popping up in May. And then I know that the, what parts are dead and which parts are alive, and I cut off the dead branches. But don't be too hasty with your beauty berries. They're, they're really a southern species. Like If you go to Arkansas, look at beauty berries. They're gigantic down there. They don't die back every winter like ours do. And so I, I'm not sure. Like Beauty berries are native, but Missouri really is not. They're a happy place, I don't think but we like them so much, we plant them anyway. Uh, so queen bumblebees, this is not a bumblebee here in this picture here. <laughs> uh, queen bumblebees, they're overwintering, like the, the queens live through the winter. They come out in the spring, they have to go find these early blooming flowers that we have right now in order to start a new colony. So, the, it's very important that as soon as that queen emerges, she finds that nectar source so that she can start building her new colony to, to make it, to prolong her um, harem. I don't know what, what's a colony of bees called. Uh, 
So there's a lot of spring flowers out right now, but make sure you have plenty for the bees. And also make sure you have some bare ground for the bumblebees to nest in. If you put two inches of mulch over all your soil, you're smothering your bees. And then, uh, so big word, well, one of the big words of the day is neonicotinoids. Uh, so neonicotinoids is a bad word. You see it, you go to a garden center and you see this plant is treated with neonicotinoids and that means that you should run away and don't buy any plants in that store uh, because neonicotinoids is like a systemic insecticide that they, um, that are, is in the plant. And so if a bee lands on a neonicotinoid treated plant, like just wandering around on the pollen, it can get that in, into its system and die. And sometimes you'll find neonicotinoid treated trees and then underneath them will be just hundreds of dead bees. So stay neonicotinoid free. Uh, if you notice that one of the plants in your yard is killing all the bees and that might have neonicotinoids in it, maybe you should just throw that one away. And also, if you go to your local garden center and they're selling them, you should give them an earful about it. Uh, so, um, last week... Vessa, yeah. do, do, the, do they have to state that it had been treated with neonicotinoids? Noids or are plants sold without advertisement that it was treated? I think that they are supposed to state that they are treated, but there's a lot of wiggle room in the native plant industry to for people to sell whatever they want. So you if you're at Home Depot or Lowe's, it should say. Like if it's how long treated, it lasts? You know, how long does it last? If you got one years ago, is it fine now? You'll have to. I don't know. You should feed some to a bee and keep it in captivity and see if it dies. I don't know. And also you don't want the neonicotinoid treated pollen to be taken back into the colony to feed the baby bees because then they're just feeding them poison too. So neonicotinoids are bad things. Uh, so this time of year, I like to visit the woodlands. I went on that hike with Brenda earlier this month. We went to St. Francis. I saw 28 different species of flower blooming there. So it was amazing. It was a great mental break for me too, to see flowers. And I'm looking forward to going back to the woods again soon to see more flowers. There's some going on in my yard, but I don't have 28 species blooming in my yard. Like you have to go to a natural place to see that kind of thing. And it's always humbling to think like how much I work on my yard and I plant all these plants and then like the woods does it naturally way better than I could ever do it, so. I just was put in my place by some woods in St. Francis State Park. But so visit the woods, look at all the layers, like trees, the shrubs, the understory shrubs, the flowers, the ground covers, the moth, the lichens, the dead logs. Like it's all like the way that nature does things is just so beautiful and, and, uh, you know, good, all, all around, like, perfect. And it's a, a good thing to go and remind ourselves where, like, that nature has already perfected this kind of gardening, and we just need to go and mimic it in our own yard. So go visit the woods, find some ideas to bring home, and apply them in your own yard. I was learning recently that wild ginger will grow straight out of the side of a log. So I'm going to try feeding my ginger patch a log and see if it takes it. Well, this time of year, I'm working on my pond. It's a good time to clean it out. But it's sort of this narrow window because the American toads are out in my yard right now making babies. 
like they're so loud at night. There's they're starting to put eggs. I don't have any eggs in my pond yet, but I've seen eggs in other ponds. So if you are cleaning out your pond, you have to time it right so that you're not cleaning out all your frog eggs. Complicated. So just try to keep as many biological things in mind when you are trying to clean up your yard. And so the benefits of having a pond is, um, or not, this isn't the benefits. These are things that you should put in your pond. Is So you should have purchased for birds near the pond. So like have a tree nearby or just put up a, a post or something for them to perch on. They like to inspect the area, make sure it's safe before going down to the water. Uh, have lots of aquatic plants in your pond for the aquatic insects to hang on to and live in. Uh, I put my aggressive plants in containers like lizard's tail. I love lizard's tail, but it's so good at traveling that I don't want my entire wet area of my yard to be lizard's tail, so I stick it in a container. And every year I root prune it to make sure it stays. It keeps doesn't escape into the rest of my yard. I don't really need a lizard's tail monoculture. And then also, if you have a, my pond has a, like a rubber liner on the bottom, because otherwise it wouldn't hold water. And the rubber liner always has erosion issues at the edge of it because the plants can't root into the shallow area right above the rubber. So I like to plant sedges and stuff that I can sort of hang over the edge of the rubber lip. And I also have some rocks in there and that helps keep the erosion um, down there. And then ponds, like if you buy one of those preformed ponds at the hardware store, they are too deep for birds. You have to have shallow areas in there. So either you can have some rocks that they can perch on, like they don't want to get their bellies wet. They just want their feet to be wet. So you need to have shallow areas. And they also really like moving water over those shallow areas so that it's not dirty from the previous bird. So you can cater your birds as much as you want, but um, those are things that birds like and the insects and the toads. I'm really amused by the American toads. I can I just think of them out there like they are and so I just feel like they're like screaming at each other, like, yeah, yeah. anyway, that's not singing. It's just yelling in toad. Uh, so, so common native pond plants is wild canna. That's my favorite plant in the world. It has like these corkscrewy little purple flowers on top, big leaves. It, it's like that red canna, except it's purple and smaller. The lizard's tail, I think the lizard's tail smells amazing. It has little white blooms that fall over, but it is very aggressive. Uh, the, the catness, the Sagittaria, that's the, it has white flowers. Pickerel weeds, also white flowers. The fragrant water lily is popular. I haven't had any luck getting it to grow, but that one is yellow. It's really cool in the wild. I love seeing it in the wild. And then soft rush is Juncus profusus, and uh, that's it's a, it's a nice texture. I have a lot of that in my yard because it's it's really great at holding. Like it can be underwater, it can be above water. It's very diverse. It's evergreen. It's a nice plant. Uh, springtime is a time to try to save as much rain as you can. So having rain barrels, we have a 300 gallon rain barrel system in our yard, which still is not enough for our roof. Uh, and a normal rain barrel is 50 gallons and you can fill up a rain barrel off of your gutter in 10 seconds. <laughs> but it's, it's, um, you know, if you're saving 50 gallons from washing away that you can use later, that's good. And the uh, plants enjoy being watered with rainwater instead of tap water with all those chemicals in it. Uh, and this is a good time of year 
to decide where you could put more water features. Like, look where your yard is flooding. Be like, oh, maybe I should put a rain garden right uphill from that to keep that water, that area from flooding. Or plant more trees and shrubs. They have such big root systems, they can suck up more water. And plant things like the scouring, not scouring rush, the, the Juncus effusus. What was that? Soft rush. Plant soft rush. It has a great root system. Sedges have great root systems. And it just it sucks all that water out of the ground and pumps it back into the air. So you cycles the water instead of having it sit in your lawn and kill your grass. You should always, every time it's raining, you should get your umbrella and go stand in your yard and watch the rain and see where it's going and make plans to save it in your yard. Another problem with saturated soils in spring is that when the ground is wet, it's easier to cause compaction. So if I have these corners, like this is a corner where the sidewalk and the street come together and either people are walking across this or cars are walking across this, and I can't grow anything in this triangle. The soil is just so compacted there. Uh, I actually, I have some uh, daffodils, they grow there just fine and some weeds. So try to avoid having any vehicles or heavy traffic on your soil when it's wet because it just smushes all the air pockets right out of your soil. And so April 23rd is Bradford pear buyback day. Is there anyone here who killed a Bradford pear? recently. I just saw Shannon celebrating. <laughs> so I actually heard that St. Louis had met its quota for Bradford pears, like they have run out of free trees to give away. Because we got rid of so many Bradford pears, which is excellent, excellent news. And we also need to get more free trees. So we, we should have, there's still more Bradford pears to kill. But I was so thrilled that my neighbor cut down their Bradford pear. So I feel like people are finally getting the message that the, the Bradford or the calorie pear is a bad plant and, and we don't want it. Although I did hear recently that there was a power company in St. Charles that is recommending calorie pear as a substitute for uh, trees that are tangled up in the lines. So I'm going to be complaining about that to somebody soon. <laughs> what uh, what company is this? <laughs> it's the Quiver River Electric Cooperative. All right. Good to it's know. It's on their, their recommended trees below power lines list. But we'll have to do something about that. Some people just need to be educated. And so, and then in this picture here, we have a little pawpaw. The pawpaw flowers are so cute and stinky. And they're these little brown things that hang down. They're really hard to take photos of because you're always taking a photo up against the sky and they're all blurry. So you have to take a photo from the side or something, but this is a good time to go scout out where you're going to harvest your pawpaws in the future because you can go find the flowers right now. So this is my salad here. I make this salad every year. It's my Easter tradition. And so uh, we have some red buds, some violets, and bit. Uh, this is like the onions that come out of your lawn. I've got some anise hyssop garlic chives, we've got parsley, rocket. So most of these are not native, but they are lawn weeds, like chickweed. A lot of those like were imported to the United States because they were edible. Like the pioneers brought them with them because they wanted something to eat in the spring. And so they put them out into the wild and, and they grow like weeds. And so 
you can embrace your roots by eating your weeds. And it's also a good way to get some nice nutrients in the spring. Like they brought those weeds with them because they are full of nutrition. And the settlers were definitely needed some nutrition after the winter. They were tired of eating dried deers. And oh, so spring is a good time to brush up on your seedling identification. And this is always like a quiz each year that somebody's like, here's like one leaf of a plant. Like, what is this one? And so just like, it's a challenge. Just pretend it's a fun challenge each year to uh, see how few leaves you need to identify a plant. Especially bluebells is one plant that always gets me because like when they just have one leaf, it's so, they look so different than a full size bluebell. They're so much smaller. Um, but I enjoy the challenge. You guys are free to send me pictures of your one leaf and I will do my best to identify it. Or I might just be like, just grow it out and tell me what it is later. <laughs> But I think you should all challenge yourself too to to go figure out what the seedlings are in your yard. Oh, so here we are, ecotype, the second big word of the day. And so I put on wild ones. They have an, a definition of ecotype uh, that it is as local as possible is is what they're saying. But there are lots of different definitions of what local means to us like in st louis does local mean that it came from st louis does it mean it came from missouri does it mean it came from the midwest like because if something came from the boot hill like it is not more local to you than something like from illinois because illinois is actually closer geographically and the boot hill has very different habitat than us so, and I mean, like beauty berries, they're from down south. And even though they grow in Missouri, they don't really thrive in St. Louis because they're from southern Missouri. And uh, so I found someone who wanted to educate us on this topic. And Shannon was like, yeah, I'll do that. So here's Shannon on Ecotype. Awesome. Let me um, get my slideshow going and share my screen. Uh, I need, it says that I cannot share until someone else has stopped sharing. Oh. Better? Yes. Okay. I'm assuming everyone can see my ecotypes uh, PowerPoint here. So I'm going to try to get through this in about 10 minutes or so, but just talking about why, where your plants are from and where the seeds uh, that your plants are from matter. And I like the definition that Bessa just used. Um, that's perfect. That's that's what we're talking about. So starting off, I'm assuming that people are familiar with the concept of an ecoregion. Uh, Doug Talamy in Homegrown National Park talks about this a lot. You find your keystone genus or genera for your ecoregions. So this is a map of all of North America and the different ecoregions present. We have a lot going on, especially as you get further south into like Mexico and Central America. But looking specifically at Missouri, we are split kind of in two by that eastern temperate forest region, that 8.0, that's then broken up into a couple different um, categories. And then the tan region being the Great Plains. Um, specifically in Missouri, we have temperate prairies. We are not far enough west to get into that arid prairie region. So I have circled over here really our four ecoregions. And just like Besso is saying, I'm so glad you brought that up about the boot heel because you can see right here that is a different ecoregion than just across the river from us in Illinois. Um, so Gold Star is St. Louis, just to kind of keep you central because the pictures are kind of strange. But I zoomed out on those ecoregion maps and the picture on the left is showing this uh, Eastern temperate forest ecoregion. This extends all the way down into Louisiana and Texas, all the way east, Georgia, the Carolinas, Florida, 
And if this map were to go further north, I mean, this is going all the way up New England and into Maine. Um, different types of temperate forest, but still grouped together as that eastern temperate forest ecoregion. So that's the eight point whatever, 8.1, 8.2, but it's all at eight point something. Same thing with the picture on the right, looking at the Great Plains region, that temperate prairie that we are a part of extends all the way north into the Dakotas, into Minnesota, and into parts of southern Canada. So this is important because I'm assuming everyone here has seen the hardiness zone map, right? This is like the perennial gardener's best friend for decades. And this just, for anyone who's not familiar, looks at the average low temperatures that you may experience in a winter. And that determines what you can potentially grow perennial plants wise in your region. So if you look back at these that we are just looking at, you have Northern Minnesota and the Dakotas versus Kansas going into Southern Missouri, uh, Oklahoma. Those are very different here. But this isn't capturing the whole picture, right? This is, like I said, just looking at the average lows in a winter. But just based off of that, Southern California and Southern Florida are the same zone. Anyone who's been to either of these can say that these are very diff different climates. So the next part of the picture that's really important to keep in mind is this climatic difference east to west. That's just as important as north to south. Um, west being so dry, east having a lot more moisture. So keeping all of that in mind, genetic diversity within a species leads to local adaptations. That's how evolution works. So you look at a species like Solidago nemoralis, the gray goldenrod, that's native from Maine to New Mexico, Montana to Florida, and up into Canada. Those are four drastically different corners and regions of this country. And um, I mean, of the continent up into Canada. So if we here in St. Louis are thinking about planting for the greatest success in our region, it makes sense that we're gonna pull from populations that have adapted over generations to our climate here in Missouri um, and those ecoregions that I showed you before. Something that generations have, have the, the we call them like local, the, the micro adaptations or local adaptations to Montana is not gonna succeed in New Mexico and that's not gonna succeed in Florida and that's not going to succeed in uh, you know the UP of Michigan. And I think this is a really good species to look at because that's just, a very impressive native range. Nine bark, one of native gardeners' favorite shrubs to look at. Again, very impressive native range. Um, looking also at this, the wetland indicator status. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with the indicator status, I'll go through this quickly. Um, I pulled this off of the Lady Bird Johnson wildflower database, but it goes over different regions. Again, St. Louis being in the Midwest, that MW. Um, Missouri, you can also look at the Eastern Mountain Piedmont region, that brown EMP zone. And this is just looking at if you find a species in an upland, lowland, so upland dry, lowland wet, um, or kind of either or situation. The FAC facultative means you're likely to find it in either one. Facultative U is means upland, you, you find it in either one, but are more likely to see it in an upland setting. FACW is the opposite of that. You'll find it in either one, but you're most likely to find it in a wetland situation. Uh, and this specific nine bark is not specifically upland or obligate wetland, but you see those as well. So all of this to say, this shows that the nine bark, which has this impressive native range, Florida up to the Dakotas, Maine through Oklahoma, here in St. Louis in the Midwest region, we are facultative wet. So that means you will find nine bark in both upland and lowland wet settings, but it's more locally adapted for those wet environments. It's gonna do better here. Our local ecotype of nine bark is more adapted to wetland settings. If you go just over to the Great Plains, that GP region, that's a facultative upland species. So if you were to just pop over, let's say into Kansas or Colorado, and pick up a nine bark or get seeds for a nine bark and bring those back to Missouri, 
they are not likely to succeed on this the same way that a local ecotype is going to, because they have had generations of those local adaptations um, to have them adapt to an upland drier environment. I want to warn everyone, the next slide has some deer skull pictures if that bothers anyone. Um, but I bring this up because if you're like me and spent any time up in the North Woods in Wisconsin, you hear examples about deer hunting and deer ecology a lot. And this concept is really prevalent in deer. So this is something that we know about, that there's a lot of research that's happened in the deer population, because that's obviously where a lot of money is. Um, but you can see white-tailed deer are much larger in the North, where there's, there's hardy winter, there's cold winters, they have to really withstand that. So you can see these, these skulls in the, the bottom right picture. They're different age deer, so it's not a perfect example, perfect comparison. But the far left and center are from Mississippi and North Carolina. They were four and five versus the one on the far right is from Indiana. And that was only two, two and a half. So you can see they're so much larger in the north because they have these local adaptations. Plants aren't deer, but it, it shows that these local adaptations really do make a difference in how populations are able to succeed where they're at. So um, in, in addition to supporting genetic diversity, and everyone knows biodiversity, diversity is what forms a strong ecosystem. And you're setting your plantings up for success if you're sourcing locally. Um, some of you maybe have heard of Taylor Creek Nursery. They're kind of a big nursery within the native plant scene. They're based out of Wisconsin and Kansas City. They have two locations. But I heard one of their growers talk at a Grow Native conference last year, and he made a point of saying that they prioritize seed collection for their growing operation within 100 miles of their op wherever they're growing. So up in Wisconsin, it's 100 miles from that location. Down in Kansas City, it's within 100 miles. Um, just to prioritize that local adaptation, support the genetic diversity there, and really have high success in their plantings. So that's all I have for you. Are there any questions? I, I know that Missouri Wildflower Nursery also uses the 100 mile radius, uh, and they are in central Missouri, so St. Louis would fall within their radius. Um, and then a lot of people, I think, order from Prairie Moon, which I don't know anything about their yeah. local ecotype. They're, they are not local in St. Louis, though. So I imagine you are not getting local plants when you're getting plants from them. They're native, but they're not yeah. genetically local. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Prairie Moon. That is one I get asked about quite a bit. It is, they're a really successful native nursery. They're based out of somewhere in Minnesota, I believe. Um, I forget exactly where, but... I don't know them well enough to know if they stick to that 100 mile radius, but we do caution people against ordering from them because Minnesota climate versus St. Louis climate is just so different. Um, like we just talked about that you're not setting yourself up for success. Yeah, and our local insects are adapted to our local plants. So yeah, they're better for the I have a question for you, Shannon. Um, on the map, it shows St. Louis really is at a convergence of two very different um, zone, like zone's not the word, but yeah, um, regions. Regions, thank you. Yeah. Um, and so my question is, so does that put us in a unique position to be able to host species from both regions or are we really more, are our gardens in St. Louis more adapted to one over the other? Yeah, that's a really good question. I was actually having this conversation today um, with someone and I, without having done research on this specific topic, it makes sense that things are like functionally native, right? So even though St. Louis technically is right here within that temperate forest zone, that doesn't mean that if you plant something that's from the Great Plains, like things follow the plants basically is what I'm trying to say. So things like your um, your cucumber magnolia that's not native in St. Louis or your oak leaf hydrangea that's not native in Missouri, um, that's still doing good and you're still hosting and you're pulling things from nearby regions. That being said, you know, if you're planting something that's native to several zones away, that's, that's not going to follow. But we do, we have very high biodiversity in Missouri for this reason of us being kind of this 
coming together of all these different zones. I would say part of being like a native plant geek is deciding how far off the deep end you're going to go to. Like you could like say my garden is only for local ecotype native plants. And then some people are like, well, in this area, I have native plants and I try to do my best to get them as local as possible. And like, there's all, there's a whole range of how crazy you can get about uh, our obsession that we have. Um, and you get to choose like where you are in the spectrum. Yeah. I love that. How like accurate of a recreation are you trying to accomplish? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think like what's really good is just knowing like that this is important. So it's just one more thing to know, like when you're trying to make a decision about this plant or that plant is you're like, well, maybe I should go for the nursery that's actually local because they're yeah. more likely to have a local plant that will do better in my yard. Yeah. And that just gives you, not that I'm sure any of you need a reason to support a local business over something like a Home Depot or a Menards, but that's just another thing. You're, you're supporting not just a local business, but your local genetic diversity. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. I'm so anti Home Depot in so many ways, Home Depot plants. I try like, when I'm there's the I neonicotinoids, there's the we have so many lists. Whenever I do these kind of these talks, I try to not name drop. I try to just say like, oh, you're a big box store, but um, you know, I figured in this kind of yes. company. Yes. Yeah. I'm not singling out Home Depot. There are plenty oh. of stores where I don't buy plants. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And we're so lucky here in St. Louis too. We have such an abundance of, of native plant growers and nurseries that really do a good job of doing this. So. Yeah. Okay. And and it doesn't, if you're at a store you haven't been to before, it doesn't hurt to ask like where they get their seeds from and do they even know? Yeah. And, and if nobody asks, they won't know that it's important. So make them think about it. Um, there is one more question here for either of you who want to answer it, um, and it is, what are the best native plants to plant to encourage some of St. Louis's rare bees? I don't really know a whole lot about rare bees. My background is entirely plant-focused, so I'm going to best to let you take that one, if that's okay. Yeah, but well, I know that... Um... Like bring conservation home was working with the slew. Yeah, with, shutter um, bee. The shutter bee project. And they did find that there were a lot of rare bees in St. Louis. Yeah. And uh and one of them was that hibiscus bee. Like we have the if you have a hibiscus, there's a bee that's entirely dependent on hibiscus. And sometimes you can find them sleeping in the hibiscus in the morning. They're very cute. That's so cute. But I didn't they, they studied my yard. I didn't have very many rare bees. I don't have very good bee diversity, I think, because I'm in like a native plant desert here. But uh, another and there's thing. also a, a blue sage bee, one that is on the Salvia area. Yeah. Is that one rare too? Uh, I don't know if it's rare. I just know that it um, it's very closely linked to the, the blue sage. So. Yeah, I was, the only thing I was really going to add is that if you could look up specialists, so there's, you know, this, the generalist bees and specialist bees, any kind of plant that leads, lends itself to those specialist bees, like the, the salvia bee or the hibiscus bee, those would be ones to prioritize over, not that I'm trying to say like Coreopsis is a, you know, keystone genera, it's so important, but those things are typically more generalist used over some of the more specialist species. So that would be yeah. something to look into. Yeah, it are, are the specialist bees are the ones that need the most help. Yeah, exactly. And so the shutter bee program, I think probably you could look that up on the internet and find out the answer to that question too. Um, I wanted to just chime in. I was attending, I attended the pollinator summit uh, this year. And one of the things that they, um, 
commented on is that as we create more um, uh, Bumblebee Atlas, you know, project in Missouri, the Shutterbee project, as we engage more people in documenting bees, what we're learning is that a lot or potentially bees that we thought uh, were no longer around are actually around. They're just not in great numbers. So just add that to um, your thoughts that you may have. And I know that from participating in Cheddar Bee that I saw rare bees in my yard, but they don't, they may come through your yard. They're not necessarily living there. They may be foraging. So it's kind of exciting just to add that into what we're talking about and encourage us to to plant and to try to, you know, as best you can document, you know, upload it to iNaturalist or, um, you know, some project that actually, if you go into iNaturalist and look for projects in your area, there'll be quite a few um, for bees. And it's it's really important work just to start to look for bees because <laughs> because they're out there. So. Yeah, very good. And so, Insects can be difficult to photograph. They're not like plants, they hold still for you. But a lot of insects, if you do net them, you can chill them down a little bit and they'll hold still for you. And then you just let them warm back up and go back to being alive again and slow them down enough to get to a few photos. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions? I have an unrelated to that question, um, but you were talking about the beautyberry earlier, and I was wondering if anybody here has tried planting a beautyberry against a south-facing wall to see if they can get them to grow um, bigger or leaf out sooner. Yeah. Sometimes in nature, I see them naturally on south-facing cliffs. And... That's probably because they like it better there. Over at yeah, my I local haven't... Barb? Go ahead. Over at my local school, there's one on a south facing wall and it's probably five foot. But I it might be a cultivar. I'm not positive. Oh, no. But it's huge. It's huge. Yeah, that's good for me to hear. I have a beauty berry that I got from the most recent seedling order. Um, that I haven't, it's in my raised bed, so it's in the ground, but it's not actually in its permanent home yet. And it, its spot is going to be a south facing. So it's good for me to hear. I'll um, update you in a year or two. Perfect. <laughs> Going back to the presentation. Oh, so this is my porch pirate here, this uh, morning dove. As I think he looks like a pirate in his little turret there. <laughs> it's actually a girl, girl dove. But uh, so she sits and nests there every year on my front porch. And it's amazing. She can stick, like there's two babies fitting there. And then they learn to fly on that shelf. And, uh, and then they poop all over my front porch. So that's my porch pirate. Uh, so right now is a good time to... Um, prevent bird strikes to windows. We had a cardinal attacking the mirrors of our truck last weekend. And so now there's like cardinal snot all over our truck. I don't know. Um, but, so ways to get the birds to not hit your windows because they look, they see their reflection in the window and they think there's sky and trees through is uh, using curtains. And getting the curtain as close to the window as possible so that it actually blocks the reflection. Putting awnings on the outside is even better because it shades the window from the outside. Uh, sticking those decals in the window, but you really need to get the window the decals close together. They need to be skinnier than a bird because if they're out here, the bird still thinks they can fly through because they're expert pilots. Uh, and you can get those like decals that are stripes. Those are usually the best ones. Or installing blinds on your window. I know that I really like to have like the big open unobstructed window for the best view of the birds, but I also don't like finding dead birds under my windows. So, um, so protect the birds. And the house cats 
kill more birds than windows, but windows is up there in killing the birds. So do your part to protect them from brain damage. So I learned something just a couple of weeks ago about um, bird strike decals that I had not thought about before, but it's such a good point that those striped decals, um, they come or you can get them in like either bicolor or tricolor. So it's white, gray, and black or white and black or white and gray, whatever it is, so that the birds see it in different lighting too. Cause there's a, if it's very dark, then it's hard to see, you know, in dusk and when things are flying around. So there's higher success rates if you have the multicolored striping or, or decals of whatever kind. And I hadn't thought about that until I was having a conversation with someone last week about that. Yeah. They need to invent windows that birds see as a solid wall. Need to get some scientist on that. But until then, we have to put up decals or awnings. Awnings are very effective, though, because they shade the whole window. And they're also good for your solar energy bills because they prevent your house from getting hot in the summer. So uh, I heard some hummingbirds were on their way, coming. Usually, I can tell when the hummingbirds will be arriving by when the, the columbine blooms. That's my indicator. So when the columbine blooms, it's time to put out my hummingbird feeder and keep an eye out for them. Um, and so hummingbirds, they like the, they like red flowers the best. They like ones that have a long tube. So they have to stick their tongue way up in there. Uh, they don't perch when they drink. So you don't need to have any sturdy plants. They can be floppy little columbine flowers. But so they like the columbine, the cardinal flower, floral honeysuckle, fire pink, golden currant. That one has a tube, but it's not red, but they still like that one. Purple beard tongue, royal catchfly, bluebells. Usually the bluebells aren't blooming anymore when the, they get here, but if they're blooming, they'll drink out of them. Indian pink, button bush. That one's not a tube or red, but like that. And red buckeye. So if you want to feed the hummingbirds naturally, you can plant some plants for them. You don't have to feed them sugar water. And I imagine all of you know, but you shouldn't dye your water red. You should you can put it in a red bottle, but don't dye it red. The hummingbirds do not need food coloring in their diet. So spring seeds like to explode. I don't know what it is about spring, but so you might be a spring seed collecting time is almost here. Like the like blood root, that seed pod's already forming. I collected a couple already actually. And those as they the seed pod dries, it's like the seeds are just packed in a way that the seed pod dries and the whole thing goes and it explodes all over the place and then you can't find your seeds anymore because they're on your floor instead of on the table. So I recommend putting seeds like in a paper sack or maybe put a piece of newspaper over the top of them so that they just hit the sides and come back down. And it's also interesting to hear because you'll hear them exploding like in the sack. Um, but so beware with these types of plants when you're collecting the seeds that you need to keep them contained because otherwise they will be everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of them also, they like the seeds head is green, then it's brown and you have to collect it right then or else it's going to explode before you collect it on the plant. So Usually, if you're collecting these spring ephemerals, you need to go out every day and collect more seeds. You can't collect all your celandine poppies the same day. So just make a daily habit of going and checking your patch for more seeds and then putting them somewhere contained so they don't all escape. And also, I would recommend wearing glasses when you collect seeds in the spring because if they explode in your face, they get in your eyes, so, which is unpleasant. So that's my safety speech for the day.
All right, so uh, last month I went through like different colors. So this um, this month we have colors of uh, so for red, we have trillium. It's kind of brown, but it's a little red. Fire pink, red buckeyes are blooming. Mine just started recently. Uh, we can get some red colors. It's another red, the coral honeysuckle. This is in a wild ones uh, when we did a, a member tour yard, and I just love how they have this bed here in the coral honeysuckle. It's beautiful. Purple. Um, you could have sand flax, wild geranium. This one here in the middle is wild geranium. This is a shooting star, which is a little bit trickier to grow, but definitely worth it if you can get it going. And then over here in the top right is the rose verbena, which likes to, like if you can let it grow out of a patch of gravel, it'll be happiest. And stick it in the edge of your driveway or something. Don't give it good dirt or it'll just die. Blue, we have bluebells, which actually start off pink and then turn blue. It's blue-eyed Mary over here, violets, Kind of blue. Um, also, friendly blue star um, is blooming, and the dwarf crested iris is blue. So you can add more blue to your yard. And yellow. So, I was saying this month is yellow. Um, so, sun and dime poppy, they're coming on soon. So the cold and ragwort. Um, so, golden ragwort's here on the left here. Bellwort, that's the one on the right. Golden Current, I had a picture of that one earlier. And then this one down here is Golden Alexander. Seems like golden. Maybe I should say April is golden colored. But um, I have a lot of yellow in my yard right now. And then white. So uh, these guys like the Dutchman's Breaches and the Ruin Enemy, they're sort of on their way out right now. But the Pussy Toes are going strong, Dogwood, um, can't see what this word is, but oh, Robin's Plantain. Yeah, I haven't seen any Robin's Plantain blooming yet, but they should be coming on soon. It's another kind of excellent bloomed. white flower. What? My Robin's Plantain bloomed a few days ago. Oh, all right. You're ahead of me. <laughs> but they're, they're really cool plant. And so word number three of the day is native ours. Uh, so Clark, native ours is a combination between a native plant and a cultivar. So it's, they took a native plant and then they bred it to have specific features, like maybe it blooms for a longer period, maybe it has double petals, maybe it's short. And some of these will conflict with what the pollinators are looking for. Like a lot of times when you're picking specific traits. Like if you have on double blooms, you probably are ending up with less parts of the flower that are making nectar and pollen. And you're having more showiness, which is good for humans, but less for the insects. And I think a lot of us are growing our gardens for the insects as well as ourselves. So Checking, so I would say native ours are better than non-native plants, but a truly native plant that is local ecotype uh, is the real thing if you're you're looking for uh, being a purist. And also, if you do have native ours in your yard, like say you originally planted native ours, then you learned about how, and you know, then you started like caring about insects, and so you put in native plants like your double blooming asters and your regular asters might crossbreed and then you have it's still not a true native because you have um, that crossbreeding so just another thing to be aware of especially if you're giving plants away to other people you don't want to give them something like you don't want to tell them it's the true native if it isn't really so just be aware of plants.
We'll make babies with anyone. And so do we have any more questions? It's my last slide. Now I'm seeing Teresa saying no, so. All right, well, um, thanks everyone for coming today, even though that uh, we canceled and then we rescheduled for the same day. Uh, I'm glad that you came and our next meeting is gonna be May 1st at 7 p.m. And, uh, and I hope you guys have plenty of American toads like this guy in your yard singing to you, serenading you at night. So go pet thank your you toads. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you. Happy gardening. Thanks for having well, me on. Yeah, thanks. And thanks to Teresa and Laura for um, making this possible. <laughs> My pleasure. Okay.